A very good evening and welcome to this evening's episode of uh, On the Record. My name is uh, Vuyam Vogo and here's what we have in store for you this evening. An impassioned plea by principals of South Africa's embattled universities. Two political parties, two civil society organizations, two our parents, two uh, intermediaries, two eminent South Africans here in Gauteng in particular for, for us to be able to step forward and to assist us in obviating the situation that we are faced with. And on a day Tabo Mbeki writes yet another essay, we dig deep into our archive. The ANC has been very concerned by the seeming ease with which comrades within our broad movement for national liberation have leveled a charge of treachery against specifically the ANC, basing themselves on allegations that we have abandoned the RDP, which in reality they cannot prove because they are false. Well, the ANC today made an impassioned plea for those who can afford higher education costs to please pay. This emerged at an urgent media briefing convened by the ANC subcommittee on education today. There's a concern from the ruling party that if students and parents continue boycotting the payment of tertiary fees, universities might just go bust. It appears there's no end in sight to the impasse between protesting students and government over calls for free education. The ANC is now calling on parents with the financial muscle to come to the party. The ANC says its interventions on higher education fees are not meant for those students who can afford tertiary education. To this end, the ruling party has appealed to the parents of higher education students who can afford to pay for the fees. I have children at university, and I, when the fees are stated, we, if we can, we pay. Sometimes late, sometimes not, you know, not late, but we pay. Um, so we don't go through a means test. And we are appealing as the African National Congress, as I said, to those of us who are able to pay to continue to do so. Higher Education Minister Blade Nzimande, who addressed the briefing in his capacity as a subcommittee member, elaborated on last week's walkout by some student leaders during a meeting in Tembisa. And at the end, we also agreed to form a smaller committee made up of representatives from students, vice chancellors, and our department, Department of Higher Education and Training to discuss all those matters and report back in a month's time. That's a very clear deadline, in a month's time, to come back and, and report. Maybe also it's important to say here that I have subsequently received a request from those students who worked out that they would like to meet with me. The ANC's pronouncement come amid continuing sporadic protests at some campuses, including in the northwest and Pretoria. The ruling party has announced additional funding will be made available in addition to the 10 billion rand that NFSS will offer for the 2016 academic year. Meanwhile, relative calm has returned to Wits University as registrations continue. Dumala Mutlaudi, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, hours after that briefing by the ANC subcommittee on education, uh, various several vice chancellors held their own briefing where they made an earnest appeal um, to both students, to parents, but to members of civil society as well, uh, saying they need to come in and indeed help or else the crisis is going to escalate. Here's what uh, Iron Ransberg had to say at that particular briefing. Hence our appeal today to political parties, to civil society organizations, to our parents, to uh, intermediaries, to eminent South Africans here in Gauteng in particular for, for us, to be able to step forward and to assist us in obviating the situation that we are faced with. 
if we were simply to withdraw the additional security, if we were simply, as some are arguing, to cancel the court orders, we would leave our institutions vulnerable to the kind of violence that we have observed this morning and throughout the last four months, of course, uh, with a let up during the, the vacation, vacation break. So our approach to this is if we can stop tomorrow this expensive cost of additional security operations at our universities, then we will do it. Uh, but that is subject to these protests becoming peaceful and these protests not resulting in the disruption of the normal activities of our universities. Well, at that uh, briefing, university vice chancellors also expressed um, their uh, concern regarding the deteriorating situation at tertiary institutions. In Pretoria, disruptions at different tertiary institutions continued. This as protesters intensified their campaign against the outsourcing of work. They are demanding the scrapping of outsourcing at UNISA, Pretoria University and the Tswane University of Technology. I'm not feeling good to be under contract and others work permanently. We want to be all equal, earning the same salary. In the CBD, employees from the Tswane municipality joined the protest. The need of these much actions is the need that is similar to us. However, we, 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 we are suffering the salary of the same, which we are earning 2.1 and we are working the same work as the same permanent are doing. Several workers gathered at the University of Pretoria's entrances refusing to leave. Vice-chancellors of Gauteng-based universities have called for a smooth start to the academic year. Today, our call for our public to respond and to work with us to secure this academic year for it to be free of any disruption and violence is precisely to help us get out of this situation that we find ourselves in, um, where some of us are spending as much as one and a half, two million rands a month on additional security. It's not sustainable. The situation was quite normal at Wits University following last week's court order. In Bloemfontein, registration got underway without any disruptions at the University of the Free State. This after the SRC raised over 1 million rand to assist students who are unable to pay. The university management pledged to raise another 1 million rand to the fund. We, as the, at the University of the Free State, we're certainly not resting on our laurels. We're working hard. I work 18 hours a day with my team to make sure we find that money somewhere to be able to assist as many students as possible to get a degree. Registration at the Mahikeng campus of the Northwest University has been halted until further notice. Protesting students have blocked the entrance leading to the university's Great Hall, where registration was expected to take place. Over 1,600 students here face financial exclusion. Northwest University has obtained a court interdict to stop students from disrupting activity. Earlier, students blocked some entrances onto campus. Meanwhile, the university says it needs an additional 91 million rand to meet the demand. The university is currently owed 117 million rand by students. All eyes will be on various campuses following calls for those who can afford to pay up. Matlaku Komane, SABC News, Johannesburg. Matlaku Komane, with roundup of what was happening elsewhere outside of uh, that briefing by university vice chancellor as well. To talk more on this, we are now joined by Minister Nale Dipando, who we saw earlier, who is a member of the chairperson, in fact, of the ANC's subcommittee on education. Welcome, Minister, and thanks very much for, for joining us. Uh, good evening, and thank you very much for the opportunity, Vuyo, and evening to the viewers as well. 
Thank you very much. And here in the studio, we do have Professor Adam Habib, who is a member um, of, who was one of the vice chancellors that uh, we saw earlier meeting here in Johannesburg to try and find a resolution to the impasse. Thanks very much for joining us, Prof, and welcome to you too. Thank you, Imbo. I love being here. If I may start uh, with you, uh, Minister, an impassioned plea, but uh, isn't it a bit too late, perhaps? Too little, too late to do anything about it at this stage. Uh, well, I think for your, what we've learned from our history is it's never too late to make an effort to restore normality and to get us uh, working as we should. And I think what we should do is make every effort to ensure that learning and teaching begins in all our universities in South Africa. The plea that we made and the report we provided was on the steps that have been taken by government in order to respond to the wide range of demands that there have been with respect to the no fee increase, the assistance to young people who've been financially excluded while they're academically uh, uh, deserving and they meet the requirements of their universities. We also have made funding available for bursaries, for scarce skills, uh, domains of study, so there have been a number of steps that have been taken by the Department of Higher Education. And it's our view that this information may not be reaching the students on the ground. And we need to do much more to ensure that we communicate. And I must thank the vice chancellors and really welcome the briefing that they held. I thought it was most helpful and it came just when it is needed. Was the ANC caught unawares? By? By the events and how they have uh, penned out so far. Well, we, you would be the first with the viewers to acknowledge that it is the ANC government that has opened up access to higher education in South Africa. We've provided over 50 billion rand in funding for poor students for higher education through the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. So we have done a great deal, but clearly, according to some of the student leaders, we've not done all that young people would want to see. And I think uh, we've responded, and the government has responded well, and we are investigating further measures through the number of structures and working groups that have been put in place. So change there has been progress there has been. More needing to be done, absolutely. And the African National Congress will continue to ensure more is done. Even with the benefit of hindsight, um, you adamant that uh, the ANC has done or the government has done the best it could do under the circumstances. Even with the benefit uh, of hindsight. Are, I, would, uh, I would challenge you to find any democracy which after 20 years has increased to the access levels that we have in South Africa today. I would challenge you to find a financial aid scheme that measures up to the program that we have in South Africa. So I'm saying in the midst of what are legitimate demands, let us not forget the progress that there has been. And government has acknowledged we will seek to do more. In fact, it has done more. We now need to get down to work, have universities back on track, and get our young people into lecture rooms and get learning and teaching underway. Okay, very much. Let's come to uh, Professor Habib here in the studio. Prof, you also made an impassioned plea as vice chancellors um, today calling on civil society, trade unions, the business community, the students themselves, everyone um, to really, you know, put their shoulder to the wheel and do something. What more can still be done that hasn't been done up until now? So I think that there's two sets of issues there. I think that the first uh, is the fact that uh, clearly there are demands. Uh, there's been significant progress since 1994, as Minister Pando has said. Uh, I don't think it's entirely been enough. Uh, there's been significant successes, but it's without doubt that the cost of higher education has been going up. And it's been going up to a point where 
ordinary students are struggling. And that's what we saw uh, in October, the explosion. Uh, there's clearly uh, something that needs to be done. Now, since October, government has made 6.9 billion additionally available on top of what was already intended. Now, that's a hell of an investment in the space of three months. I can't think of another cause that has generated in three months an additional 6.9 billion. First for the 2 billion for the 0%, 2.4 for historic debt, for an another 2 billion for underfunded and funded students. Now, clearly that's a first step. That's not enough. There's still a big group of people that are left out. That's what we call the missing middle. They are too rich for NISFAS, but too poor to pay for the cost of higher education. And there's a plan around that, largely managed by Sizwe and Kesana around the chairperson of NISFAS, around a new funding vehicle through the banking system. Now, we're not in a position to do that now. We're pioneering it. It will come in play in 2017. But the question is, there is a plan. And then obviously the president has appointed the presidential task team or the presidential commission on this issue. So more needs to be done. But clearly, a significant contribution has already been done. So, yes, there's been some benefit. Clearly, I will say, we all collectively were caught napping in October. Now that we've been caught, we've started to make some massive in interventions. And clearly, we're never going to achieve free education for the poor in one single stroke. It has to be part of a process. So that's the first set of issues I'd raise. The second is even when there is protest, and protest is legitimate. We do expect the protest to be nonviolent. We do express the protest not to prevent the normal operations. Now, let me give you an example of what happened in some of our places. Students came at WITS and they said, we're not going to allow anybody to register, either free education or no education. Now, firstly, that's an un unacceptable slogan. Secondly, you threaten people. Thirdly, you forced us to rely only on online. And online assists the middle class and upper middle classes who have access to facilities and credit cards. The poor person, the grandfather from Limpopo, who jumped on a bus for five hours, came with his grandson to register, was prevented. Is that not hurting the very poor that we are meant to serve? And so our argument is that if we are moving towards free education for the poor, that that does not mean we destroy our higher education system now, because we'll never be able to rebuild it. And so we're calling on protesters to be reasonable, to be act within the confines of our constitution. Yes, you're entitled to protest, but there are also rules around how you protest. And that's the other impassioned plea that we're making. Minister, as a leader of society, isn't the time that perhaps you go beyond the plea? Yes, certainly. I think uh, one of the things we must do, as I've said, is to go out there and communicate. I think all the students, the parents, and the community need to be aware of what has been agreed and what has been put in place by government as well as by university leadership. And we do agree in our statement that protest is permitted in terms of our constitution, but it must be within the law, it must be peaceful, Destruction of property, violence, intimidation do not support a cause to do well. And so we are saying we want peaceful demonstration, peaceful protest, and an end to intimidation and any violence on campuses. And we really appeal to young people, and we will be engaging with them on the ground. We ask you, we've asked our ANC branches to also be out there to share this information, we're going to make it widely available so that every young person and community member, as well as parent, is aware of what has been done. Have you engaged your progressive um, alliance uh, that comprises of your SASCOs and your youth leagues and your, your Communist Party uh, young people, for example? And would you consider... Yes, well, they, attend, uh, they are members of the committee. Obviously, they attend our meetings. And we do meet with the Progressive Youth Alliance on a regular basis. And you would have heard their statements, which are in accord with what we uh, released today. And, and what about the youth formations? I mean, we know for a fact now that universities have become just another site of struggle. Political parties have, uh, you know, uh, are trying to penetrate universities. 
Well, I think uh, what we're hoping for, Vuyo, is that all of us begin to change our messaging and start to convey that major victories have been won. And the media has an important role in this. It is you who will assert either the reasonableness of the steps that have been taken or the excitement for your cameras of violence and intimidation. So we need a voice out there into South Africa which says we now need to move back into learning and teaching. The matters that are not resolved are receiving attention. We have time frames, and there will be responses on those. But recognize as well where we, victories have been won. And let us affirm that this takes us a major step forward, and we are able to deal with the other issues as well. Professor Habib, to what extent would you say um, in politics has a, has a hand in all of this? Well, politics def definitely has a hand in this. So, I mean, one of the things that uh, the vice chancellor said at, its, at the press conference is not only did we make an impassioned plea for civil society to get involved, we said that we ask leaders of political parties to show some leadership. That actually we do believe that a fair degree of the tensions is in part got to do with the fact that political parties are intervening in particular ways. And we think that, uh, yes, political parties are entitled to engage and compete uh, in a local government elections. They're entitled to have different political differences. But they must not compromise the higher education project. They must not compromise universities. Because if they do so, they will destroy one of the fundamental planks to addressing economic inequality in our society. All of the political party leaders say to us, that they are committed to inclusive development and democracy. Well, if you're interested in, in inclusive development, you're going to need those universities. And you cannot destroy those universities, and you should be working with your people on the ground, with your student leadership on the ground, to ensure that they don't undermine the efficient functioning or the, uh, or the infrastructure of the universities themselves. And that is an appeal we're making to all political parties, because we do believe that political party leadership could play an important role in this regard. Is your voice being heard? I hope it's being heard. We made it fairly loud uh, today. We are speaking to multiple stakeholders. Uh, we are having a conversation with multiple other leaders. And we are asking society as a whole to start standing up and saying to political parties, we expect you to behave with a sense of dignity, with a sense of decorum, and with a sense of responsibility. Do not play around with public institutions. These are important assets that collectively we built. And in, in people in the society made enormous sacrifices for these public institutions. We should not be playing short-term political gains with public institutions. Minister, shouldn't um, the ANC perhaps take a lead on this and actually convene political parties at a very formal uh, um, uh, level and in a more, in a very deliberate way and say, let's sit down and trust this uh, out? Well, Vuyo, I think the ANC has come out very clearly today to state its support for the steps that have been taken, led by Minister Nzimandi, as well as with the president playing a very important role in this process. We're saying that a provision has been made, and we'll talk to any party that wishes to, to speak to us. I know Minister Nzimande is convening a series of meetings, and certainly in Parliament, the uh, various political parties will meet as Parliament convenes, as committees next week, to continue to deliberate on these matters. And I think uh, the appeal that has been made to political parties to support the call for a return to lecture rooms, to support a call for no violence, to support a call for no intimidation, and also to ask that the government continues to meet the timeframes that it has set in place and to support the various working groups. We are clear on those things and we're ready to talk to anyone. In fact, by being here today on the major public broadcaster, we are speaking to everyone. And I'm sure the message from Professor Habib and his colleagues this afternoon, as well as ourselves, is now loud and clear 
and very visible. And we'll see what the reaction is tomorrow. We are hoping for a positive reaction. We'll engage our branches. We're going to talk to our structures, make sure everybody is alert to what needs to be done. And we will support the institutions of higher learning to get back on track. Minister Prof, I'm going to ask uh, you, you to hold your thoughts right there. We're going to take a quick ad break. We'll be back right after this. Milkstout chocolate infused. Savor the moment. The crafted chocolate stout made to be savored responsibly by people over the age of 18. Mancosa, Southern Africa's leading distance learning institution. Accredited, affordable, and accessible management education programs. Higher certificates, diplomas, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Register at Mancosa and be part of Southern Africa's leading private business school. Visit our website, mancosa.co.za. Mancosa. Management education. Reimagine. Welcome back, and if you've just joined us, you're watching On The Record. And this evening, we're talking about the continuing crisis in our universities, which has turned nasty and violent in certain places. Professor Habib, one and a half to two million rands a month that you guys are spending, each university is spending, on average, um, the cost of security. Now, what happens if the message that uh, the minister is talking about is not heard? What happens if the plea that you made today in earnest um, is not going to yield results? So let me say that it seems to me that the first thing we need to do, uh, remember, is the only reason we've got a significant amount of private security on campus is because we couldn't be guaranteed that safety and security was there and we couldn't be guaranteed that registration would happen. Universities are meant to be places of learning. They are not meant to have large numbers of private security and public order policing. No vice chancellor wants that in this country. What we want to ensure is the learning project is intact. And what we want to ensure is that students and people who've come from very far away are allowed to register. When small groups of protesters were preventing them from doing so on Monday, when I went down to try and negotiate and say, please let the registration happen. You can protest, but please let the registration happen. And when that was not possible, when people were threatened, that's when we brought in security. And since we've had the security, we've had registration every single day, 100% of the time. Now, while we've got that, we've had a whole series of negotiations happening with a whole series of players, both at the student leadership level, but also with outside stakeholders, and that's why our impassioned plea. We recognize that I, all of us should not be spending as much money as we are on security. That money should be going into the academic project. But the only time we can do that is if people decide that they're not going to stop the operations of the university, that they're not going to threaten life, and that they're going to allow registration to happen. Otherwise, we will not have registration and the universities will close down. And that's what, what this is about. So we would love to, to withdraw the, the, the security, and it's something that we're looking at, but we can only do so once we've got some confidence that safety and security is guaranteed and the normal operations of the universities will be allowed. Minister, what should these vice, vice chancellors be doing? Because they seem, um, if you listen to Professor Habib, he says, We've done everything we could possibly do. Well, uh, I think now it is for the students to assist us, the leadership, by ensuring that they do commit to peaceful protest if they want to continue their protest in the midst of all the agreements and decisions there have been. And if they do so, then I'm sure the universities will be able to register the students 
who wish to uh, register. We hope all students want to register because we believe they went to university to acquire a qualification. So we want to return to learning and teaching in an environment that allows that. And we believe, as the vice chancellors do, that uh, the spending of resources on security is actually taking money away from support that should be provided to students. So we certainly want to see an end to the uh, presence of private security on our campuses. It's not an environment any of us like. However, the vice chancellors have a responsibility to protect the property of the public, which is the universities, and to ensure all persons who are on campus are safe and are able to do what they come onto campuses to do. Well, universities are about learning and teaching, and they must do this. Well, you are going to a Lekhutla um, in, the, in the next week or so, uh, which will lead to a cabinet Lekhutla and which will feed onto the uh, President's State of the Nation address. As the subcommittee of the ANC on Education, are you going to table anything new um, before your colleagues? Well, we certainly uh, want to ensure that we do brief the ANC on where matters stand and on what we're proposing should be looked at as we advance uh, into this year and into the subsequent uh, academic years of 2017-18. We think the issues of the poorest students are beginning to be addressed. We're happy with the steps that have been taken. We're concerned about this gap, this missing middle, as it's called. And we're very pleased that the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, led by the chairperson, Mr. Nlasana, is actually looking substantively at this issue and that they will come back to us with a report. So uh, we are seized with all the matters. And as government, we wish to find solutions that will work for South Africa and ensure that we achieve the ambitious goals that we have for higher education. Prof, if you were to sit in the meetings that Minister Panda will be part of over the next couple of weeks, what would you raise with them or what would you say to the people who will be convening? So I'd say three things. I, say, I would say the first, as Minister Panda has said, is that we need to address the gap of the missing middle. It's clearly a huge challenge. Uh, and we have to figure out a way on addressing this. Which she says they are seized with. Which, the question, I guess, is how? Well, the, as I said uh, earlier on, and as Minister Pando said, there is a plan. That plan is looking at an additional funding vehicle. It's based on the banking system. They are pioneering and looking at how to do that, how to keep interest rates low, how to ensure that anybody between the 200,000 and the 600,000 family income is covered in one form or the other. There may be trade-offs. I want to be clear about that. There's always trade-offs, but there is a plan around that. That's the first thing. The second thing that I would say we need to look at is a sustainable fee regime. And we have to do that in engagement between government and the universities. How do we establish a sustainable fee regime that allows us to look at the cost structures of universities, but at the same time does not make it overly burdensome on middle class and upper middle class people? That's the second plan. And then the third plan, it seems to me, we need to look at the subsidy of the university. The subsidy of the university in per capita terms has been declining for a long period. Money's been going up, but the student numbers have been going up, and per capita, it's been going down, and we clearly need to address this. I want to end by saying, if we're going to address free education for the poor, we have to understand there'll be trade-offs, and that those trade-offs cannot simply be a product of the political elite. Collectively, as a society, we need to come together and say, we're going to fund this and not fund that, or we're going to pay more in taxes to enable this to happen because this is in our long-term future. That's how it's going to be done. There's never a free lunch. Somebody is going to pay, whether we're going to pay it from the fiscus or whether somebody else is going to pay it. And that's the thing that we need to think through. Ultimately, I think we can only resolve this problem if all stakeholders come together. Government has to be there. The universities have to be there. I think the private sector has to be there. 
And I think a component of burdens, at least rich people, have to be paying for their part of higher education. What's your worst fear in the event, well, everyone's heart may just be at the right place, but what if things don't happen? What's your worst fear? What could, what's the worst that can happen? My, my real fear is unintended consequences. What we are doing now is we, 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 you, you, there's a burden increasing on universities financially. Let me give you an example. At Wits University, we had the 0% increase. Government made 146 million available. We took a 25 million hit. Then we had a demand for insourcing. And our first uh, uh, act in that regard was to increase uh, minimum wages to 4,500 rand, a 17 million hit. The insourcing is going to cost another 50, 60, 100 million rand. We've made a whole series of concessions around first payments, around 12 to 20 million. We're already between 60 to 65 million that we've spent additionally. You carry on doing this. And, and sorry, one other thing. We're not sure about fees. We're all finding out in every university that the fees are less, that people are not paying fees the way they have in previous years. If we allow this to continue, we'll financially bankrupt the university. And if we financially bankrupt the universities, what we would have effectively done is destroyed the best performing higher education system on the African continent. And that will be dangerous for our society and dangerous for the acceleration of inequality in our society. Your concluding remarks, Minister, and perhaps uh, while you're doing that, answer the question of shouldn't you take a resolution or some measures just like uh, you did? I mean, you took a resolution on health around in sourcing at, the, at your last um, conference. Here's a situation mm. that perhaps you should regard as an emergency. And as the ruling party, perhaps uh, take an, shall we call it an interim resolution and say, here is a position that we think we should take around in sourcing for all the what it is doing to the universities, as, as, uh, as, uh, as has been uh, encapsulated in what uh, Professor Habib has just said? Uh, well, Vuyo, I think uh, one must say that uh, labor brokers, who are really those who manage outsourcing, uh, do seem not to treat workers fairly. Workers must receive fair wages. And if a model for such can be found, it must be adopted. So I think we would not quarrel with ensuring that workers are treated fairly, that they earn an honest wage, and are not abused by any labor broker. So that is an important point that we would agree. But we need to be very careful about government trying to run universities. The operational matters, the execution of policies within the institution financial administration, salary policy, that is all determined within the university environment. It can't be determined by government. We will do what we need to do as the African National Congress and as government, but the leadership of institutions, the council, the senate, the vice chancellors must run their institutions and run them uh, properly. So we would certainly attend to the policy issues which we've taken resolutions on, such as a framework for fee levels uh, within higher education. And of course, if the regulatory framework that is eventually developed has financial implications for government, government would have to look at how it raises resources uh, to meet that obligation. But all the future steps that should be taken require proper analysis, scrutiny of implications to ensure that we don't arrive at the dismal perspective uh, Professor Habib has warned us about. We cannot afford to diminish the quality and excellence we have in several of our institutions. We have to remain a functioning higher education system and everything that we do must ensure that we retain that character. And your ally, Kosatu, was right after all that perhaps the labor brokering issue should have been an issue that the ANC too really focused on. Would you agree? What, what we have done is that an act was passed which governs how labor brokers should conduct themselves. I don't know whether they're absorb, uh, observing the law, and I'm not sure whether unions are actually taking them on in terms of what they should do 
in terms of the act that was passed on temporary workers. Mr. Pando, Professor Abib, thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's where we're going to leave this uh, particular discussion. Well, we're going to take a quick ad break. After the break, what is going on or is going to happen to Lesotho, given what uh, the decisions that were taken by SADC this afternoon? Are we going to go back to that crisis that uh, SADC tried to resolve a short while ago? That's what we're going to discuss after this short ad break. Savor the moment. The crafted chocolate stout made to be savored responsibly by people over the age of 18. Mancosa, Southern Africa's leading distance learning institution. Accredited, affordable and accessible management education programs. Higher certificates, diplomas, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Register at Mancosa and be part of Southern Africa's leading private business school. Visit our website, mancosa.co.za. Mancosa. Management education reimagined. Welcome back. You're watching On The Record. Well, the SADC Double Troika Extraordinary Summit scheduled for Khaboroni, Botswana, has decided to disengage all activities in Lesotho until it meets again in August. This was confirmed by President Jacob Zuma. The summit failed to reach consensus to release the report of the Commission of Inquiry, which investigated the death of former Lesotho Army Commander Maparangwe Mahao. Heads of state and the government from six double troika countries held closed preliminary talks with Lesotho's Prime Minister Pagadita Musisidi. President Jacob Zuma says SADC will release a full communique tomorrow. Now joining us uh, is now is SABC reporter Ntakwana Ngatane who is uh, in Khaboroni. Ntakwana, welcome and uh, thanks very much for joining us. Were you surprised by the turn of events? Well, we, are, we actually had this conversation yesterday about the likely outcomes of today's summit. And one of the things that I said when I spoke to some of my colleagues yesterday was looking at the stance that Lesotho seems to be taking even though the country was coming to the summit, we were not sure if Lesotho was going to change that stance. And we, know, know, we now know that they did not. And as a result, we looked at options and said uh, Sadak could perhaps go as far as uh, suspending Lesotho like it did Madagascar, could it? Um, some in Lesotho, civil society organizations, have been calling for sanctions on individuals in government in Lesotho. And we saw this, or, or we looked at this as, as uh, these are some of the options that could happen if consensus was not reached. Because when we spoke to the officials on Saturday who were meeting over the weekend here prior to the summit, they were saying to us, the thing that they expect to happen, that they hope will happen, is that there will be consensus because that is the only con report that was done, compiled by Judge Mpapi Pumapi following his commission in Lesotho will be released. And so, yes, the turn of events is really not surprising um, because we were expecting it to go one way or the other, and this is the way that it has gone. Buya. Well, I mean, one of the reasons being given is that um, the Lesotho government doesn't want to conflate the roles. In other words, the judiciary should be allowed to do its work without interference. Now, uh, let me put it this way. Do you buy that story? I'll tell you what happens, Vuyo. In Lesotho in particular, there are those who say, well, the Lesotho government is 
uh, gaining from convenience, if you like, of this particular case. It may not necessarily have had anything to do with it by, by keeping quiet and particularly by not filing replying affidavits in that case when it went to the High Court in Lesotho. It may be an indication that the government seems to want to benefit from the case being in the courts. Now, whether or not this is there are those who say, well, any country deserves for its institutions, especially the judiciary, to be respected. Any sovereign country deserves for its institutions to be respected. And those who are rallying behind Prime Minister Pakati Tamo Sisiri continue to say he has taken the right route. They continue to say that what he has done shows that he is a man of his word and therefore he stands for his country. But of course, what the losses will be is another issue. We're Did you get a sense uh, that, uh, you know, the Sada community broadly kind of understood where he came from, even if it may have had, it may have, uh, uh, you know, wanted him to take a different position? But did they, at the very least, understand him or where he comes from? Well, interestingly enough, Vuyo, when we spoke to President Jacob Zuma this afternoon following the SADAC summit, this is one of the questions that we asked him. Does SADAC's decision mean that it doesn't agree that countries should respect the autonomy of their judiciaries or their judicial systems? And he said, certainly not. But as a member of an international organization, there are treaties that you get into. For instance, the SADAC Treaty states in Article 31 that uh, members of SADAC working in a member country are immune to, you know, uh, or have immunities in the territories that they work in. And this is the case of the SADAC Commission when it went to court to contest the case by Lieutenant Colonel Hashazi, saying that uh, for them to be working in Lesotho, they were working under the treaty. But of course, the Lesotho government has a different view. For the Sadak Commission to be in Lesotho, they say it had to be domesticated, it had to be established under the laws of Lesotho, a gazette in Lesotho had to be issued, and that in itself meant that it had to oblige with the laws of that territory. So this is an issue uh, where the jury is out at the moment, and I suppose uh, we have to wait and see whether Lesotho will now go and try and find other member states who perhaps were not part of this double troika to get a sense of whether or not they agree with the double troika. We're talking about six countries that include the chairperson of SADA as well as the chairperson of the organ on politics, defense and security, Mozambique, and the chairperson of SADAC is uh, Botswana. The other countries, as you will know, would have been Swaziland, Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania that were here today. We now, uh, given uh, the, uh, just the role that SADAC has had to play in bringing together Lesotho's warring uh, factions, um, given the role that SADAC has played in uh, restoring, you know, a, a degree of stability and getting Basutu um, to, an, to an election uh, last year. What do you think is going to happen um, uh, in the next few months, um, straight right up to August, when this issue will be revisited? What are the chances of things getting out of hand? Well, at this point in time, you'll remember that Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa's uh, mandate has been renewed. And the reason it was renewed was so that he could continue uh, through the facilitation process to assist Lesotho with constitutional and political reforms in the country. And this was supposed to be a long-term project that was supposed to instill long-term stability in Lesotho. And this is particularly the first area probably that will be affected. I've also talked about uh, issues like the meeting that recently happened in Lesotho with SADAC ministers of communication who saw communication as one of the areas that cause instability in the country because there isn't enough information going out of the member states to your general population and they were saying that this is one of the threats and deal with it. now these are just some of the areas where cooperation uh, is key where the member states of SADAC are concerned so when you talk about what the impact will be as i've said uh, i think we will start counting the losses 
even as I've said that, there are those who say that you're talking about the political situation in Lesotho beginning August 2014. And some say, well, uh, before August 2014, there was for instance, supposed to be a motion of no confidence in Parliament to unseat then Prime Minister Tom Tabani. And following the elections in Lesotho, we find that the same coalition that wanted to get into power to unseat Tabani is exactly the same one um, that would have happened without the election. So was it worth it to spend, as you remember, more than 200 million Maluti rand? Uh, to go to an election. And so some who look at it that way say perhaps Sadak did not really help Lesotho, where others say that perhaps the political or the aspect of the facilitation was left um, unattended, which is why we ended up seeing the death of former commander Maaparangwe Mahao. So different people with different opinions. But as I say, we start counting now and see what the impact will be from now until August. Buyo. Thank you very much, Ntagwana, from um, uh, Khaburuni, where the Sadek Troika was meeting today, taking, of course, a resolution, um, the resolution that it took tomorrow. Ntagwana will, of course, be bringing us up to speed with that communique. What will Sadek communicate to the rest of the region and to the world? She will be watching that for us. Well, right now, we're taking a quick break. After the break, we we'll look at uh, the Tabombeki, the second Tabombeki essay, and what it has done. Mancosa, Southern Africa's leading distance learning institution, accredited, affordable and accessible management education programs, higher certificates, diplomas, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Register at Mancosa and be part of Southern Africa's leading private business school. Visit our website, mancosa.co.today. Mancosa, management education reimagined. New Castle Milk Stout Chocolate Infused. Savor the moment. The crafted chocolate stout made to be savored responsibly by people over the age of 18. Well, a lot has been said about uh, former President Thabo Mbeki's decision to release essays detailing his time at the helm of the government and of the ANC. This has generated a lot of debate in many uh, different sections, among many different sections of our society. Well, today's essay was titled, When Your Position Can't Be Sustained, Create a Scarecrow, The Menace of, of Post-Apartheid South Africa. Well, we have uh, run of, out of time. We're going to get into the detail of what he says in that particular essay. But we thought going into our archives for some context um, would help a great deal. For in the piece um, that uh, he has uh, written today, he talks broadly about um, the relationship um, and uh, the role that debate uh, play. He touches on the issue of debate within uh, the ANC and its allies, but also talks about uh, the relationship with uh, some of uh, the a between the ANC and uh, its uh, allies. Just take a, a quick look at this uh, particular soundbite that we got from our archive. This was um, in 1998, if I'm not mistaken, Shaft 21 here in Johannesburg, and uh, President Thabo Mbeki delivered there uh, what was one of the most hardest hitting criticisms of uh, the South African Communist Party. And here's a little uh, 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 something from what you said there. The ANC has been very concerned by the seeming ease with which comrades within our broad movement for national liberation have leveled a charge of treachery against specifically the ANC. 
basing themselves on allegations that we have abandoned the RDP, which in reality they cannot prove because they are false. This manner of proceeding, which is very new in the Congress movement, with which all the older cadres of our movement are completely unfamiliar, of laying false charges against one another within the movement so that we can pose as the sole genuine representatives of the people is something that we must all of us address. The idea that any of our organizations can build itself on the basis of scavenging on the carcass of a savaged ANC is wrong in the extreme. This is so because the death of the ANC, which will not happen, would also mean the death of the rest of the progressive movement of our country. The idea must also be understood clearly that many of the forces we use to wage war against one another, including some members of the media, cooperate with us only because they want us to tear one another apart. An alliance is not going to be built merely on sentimentality, on the past struggles that we have waged, which is an important legacy that we have. But we can't sustain that alliance, we all know, simply on memory and of the archive of revolutionary struggle. <laughs> and therefore, when you, when you take the trouble, as you have, in what is a very busy schedule, to read our documentation in detail, seriously and critically. We take that not as, in the first place, an attack on the part at all on the party, but as, a, as an indication of the seriousness with which you hold this Congress and this party. And that's how this alliance is going to be built, uh, Comrade President of the ANC and therefore leader of this alliance. You have also, like some of the international guests, spoken as a delegate to this Congress. And that's exactly what we expect of the ANC and of its leadership. We don't want it to be an observer of this Congress. We don't want it to be an observer that complains outside of this Congress. We want forthright engagement from the leader, the leading organization of our lines. As I stand up then also to thank you for the, the seriousness with which you have taken this Congress, I'm also very mindful of the point that you raised towards the end of your, your speech in which you say that one of the problems of the engagement between us as, an, as alliance partners is, is that often it travels through the ladies and gentlemen sitting in front of us through the media. Often it gets distorted through that distorting mirror. And we often talk to each other on the basis of impressions that we've formed of each other through those sets of distortions. You say that we have to be careful of headlines. We know very well what tomorrow's headlines are going to be. They're going to be the same as today's headlines of all the newspapers. And those headlines won't read SACP roasts ANC. They'll read ANC roasts SACP. Long live the Revolutionary Alliance. Long live the ANC. Long live. Long live. Viva ANC SACP Casato Alliance. Viva. Viva.